In today's lesson, we're going to look at metal properties. So the first aim is to describe the properties of metal, then explain the importance of alloys. Those are materials made from a mixture of metals or other elements. And then finally, evaluate the importance of recycling metals. So let's start off with an amusing idea that if Iron Man was actually made from iron, the film would be more like a disaster movie than a superhero movie. For one thing, iron is incredibly heavy, so it'd be pretty hard to move, let alone fly. And secondly, we all know iron is very susceptible to corrosion. It rusts. So if you're flying around the atmosphere with lots of water and oxygen, it won't take long before your suit rusts and you fall to the ground in a mess of debris. So we can assume that Iron Man's suit isn't actually made from iron, but probably an alloy containing a mixture of metals. I think it's probably fair to say that you know most of the general properties of metals. For example, they're very strong. If you hit a metal with a hammer, it's not going to break. Metals are excellent conductors of heat, and they also have high melting points, with the exception of some alkali metals and mercury. And also we know that metals such as copper are excellent conductors of electricity. To understand why, you need to understand the structure of metals, but that will be a different lesson. Some metals have very unique properties. That means properties that they possess, but don't represent necessarily all other metals. So corrosion, for example, is when water affects and chemically reacts with a metal. So copper is corrosion resistant. That's why we can use it for metal pipes. I've already shown you that copper is an excellent conductor of electricity, which is why we use it in electrical wiring. Copper is also very ductile. That means it can be stretched. And that's another reason why we can use it to form electrical cables. Aluminium is unique because it has a low density. It's a very light metal. That's why we build planes using aluminium. And gold is very shiny. It's malleable. That means we can bend it and shape it. And it's very unreactive. So no other elements can get to it, or rather bond with it. For this reason, it's perfect for being used to make jewellery. But we can also use gold to make dental fillings. Gold is also an excellent conductor of electricity, but it's way more expensive than copper. However, the price of copper is increasing because we're very low on supply. Not all properties that are unique to metals are actually good qualities. For example, iron rusts. Rusting is a form of corrosion that we only use to describe iron. So you would never say copper rusts, only iron rusts. And that's because of the way in which it does it. So iron is an oxygen-hungry metal and it will readily react with oxygen. But if it gets wet, it will continue to react, but this time with water as well. So when we react iron with oxygen and then water, we produce hydrated iron-3 oxide, commonly known as rust. The 3 here is referring to how many oxygens have combined with the iron. So this would be iron-3 oxide because the iron has bonded to 3 oxygen atoms. And if we add water to this, then we'll make hydrated, hydrated, when you're hydrated you drunk water, hydrated iron-3 oxide. So now we can describe the properties of metals. So we've just looked at how some metals have weaknesses and we can make alloys out of them to improve their properties. So an alloy is a material made from a mixture of metals. You could also say where metal reacts with a non-metal. So some alloys commonly include carbon. When metals are combined with other elements, their properties change and they suddenly have new uses. So, when we extract iron by reduction with carbon, it's actually impure. There's still stuff stuck to it or bonded with the iron, and that makes it brittle. So, freshly extracted iron is about 96% iron with 4% impurities. And as I said, it's brittle. That means it breaks easily. So, if iron in this state was used as weaponry, well, let's just say it wouldn't make a very good episode of Game of Thrones. So we can remove the impurities from iron to make pure iron. When you do this, the iron becomes soft, bendy, and very easy to shape, malleable. And that's because the atoms have a regular arrangement. What that means is they form straight layers sitting on top of each other. For that reason, these layers can just slide over each other very easily. That's why the metal is soft and easy to shape. But iron in that form isn't incredibly useful to us. We need to mix it with other stuff to make iron alloys. An iron alloy we call steel, which you may have heard of. 
To make steel, we can mix melted iron with small amounts of carbon. That will make us sort of malleable iron, not too far off the bendy iron, but a little bit more rigid. And that's useful for making car bodies or car frames. Or we can mix the iron with lots of carbon, which makes it much harder, so it's much better for weaponry and armour. Or we could go a completely different way and mix it with the metals chromium and nickel which makes it corrosion or rust resistant. Iron that's been treated in this way is called stainless steel and that's why our sinks never rust or a lot of kitchenware never rusts because it's actually an alloy of iron called stainless steel with chromium and nickel. So why do the properties change when we mix them with other metals? Well the only example you need to know is why iron becomes harder when we mix it with other metals. If you remember pure iron, all the atoms are arranged regularly, so they easily slide over each other. Look what happens when we add carbon. Carbon upsets the regular arrangement because we have different size atoms, smaller ones and larger ones. This makes it impossible to have this nice regular arrangement, so now we have upset the regular arrangement, but this isn't a bad thing. Because of this, the layers cannot slide over each other. This makes the iron, or rather steel now, much harder. This again has come up in exams again and again, and this is exactly what you would write down if presented with this problem. Another metal that we turn into an alloy is gold, and that's because gold in its natural state is very soft and bendy. So if someone's making the claim that their watch, for example, is pure gold, just grab it and try to bend it, and you'll see that you can't, and therefore proving it cannot be pure gold. So to make gold harder, we basically mix it with copper, zinc and nickel. We assess the purity of gold using these two words, carrots and fineness. So they describe gold purity. Carrots are given a rating out of 24. So you, for example, could have a 24 carat gold watch or something. Not that you would, but just so you understand how to use the word. Fineness is a measure of parts per thousand. So if a piece of gold jewellery had a fineness of 500, that means 500 of the atoms for every thousand would be gold and 500 would be something else. Now gold purity calculations don't come up that often, but they can come up in an exam. So let's say you had a 12 karat gold ring. How would you work out the purity? Well, that'd be 12 out of 24, because 24 is the maximum purity you can have, times 100. So this would be 50% pure and 50% of a thousand would be a fineness of 500. Remember, carrot is always out of 24, and fineness is always out of a thousand. If this gold crown was 18 carat gold, then you'd work out the purity as follows. 18 divided by 24 times 100 would give you a purity of 75%. So the fineness would be 75% of a thousand, which would be 750 fineness. But alloys get way cooler than that, so now let me introduce you to smart alloys. Smart alloys are basically, well, they're not really intelligent, but they can remember their original shape. They're like the kind of metal you might give James Bond or Batman. So nitinol is such an alloy. It sounds a bit like a drug you'd give someone who wants to give up smoking. But actually it's a metal, it's an alloy, a smart alloy, and it's made from nickel and titanium. So let's say you had a wire of nitinol and you bent it out of shape. If you heated it, then it basically allows the atoms to separate slightly and it remembers its original shape and will snap back into its original shape. Check this out. So here I've got nitinol, I'm bending it into a coil. And there's some hot water here. I'm going to put it in the hot water and look what happens. What? Okay, let's see that in slow-mo. Isn't that amazing? Come on, you can say what you like, but science is pretty awesome. So a lot of the time we make things and then we decide on how they can be used. For example, we can use nitinol to make glasses frames. Imagine if you accidentally sat on your glasses and bent the frame out of shape. Wouldn't it be awesome if you could just heat it up and it reforms the original shape? A more complex use is stents used in damaged blood vessels. So here, let's say, is an artery and it's been blocked up by cholesterol. So a stent is a bit like a hollow wire cylinder which you basically scrunch up and insert into the artery and then the body heat will basically cause it to reform its original shape. As a result, it squashes 
the cholesterol or the plaque against the sides of the wall so more blood can flow through, so your blood pressure is reduced. And that's how you explain the importance of alloys. So now let's look at the issue of whether we should recycle metals. This is going to be more or less a one-sided argument, but there are two sides to consider. So firstly, if you remember, ores are in limited supply. If we keep using them, we will run out of that metal. And let's not forget that mining and extracting through reduction with carbon or electrolysis requires energy. Energy often means we're burning fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are expensive and they're also non-renewable. Recycling metals basically uses a fraction of that energy. So it saves a lot of energy and therefore money. So as I've already said, fossil fuels are expensive and harmful to the environment when we burn them because they release greenhouse gases which are linked to climate change. And obviously if we're not throwing these away, these metals, then there's less rubbish going into our landfill sites so it saves land which we can therefore use to grow food and so on. So what possible objection could there be? Well, recycling also costs money. You have to collect the metals, transport the metals, sort them out and then process them. Now, this may seem like an imbalanced argument, but one thing to consider is it really depends on the type of metal you are recycling, whether you should actually bother doing it or not. Copper and aluminium are quite expensive to extract because we use electrolysis to purify them. There are also, well, especially coppers in limited supply, so it's very important we recycle those metals. But that's not necessarily true for all metals. And that's how you evaluate the importance of recycling metals.